Hey moms and dads, boys and girls, Brian Cusco here at Triple B. And today we've got Mr. Phil Goss, president of US ARC, giving his talk at Herpeton. And Phil's going to talk about what US ARC does. If you watched a vlog I put out recently, you can find a link down in the description uh, talking about the recent bill that's passing in Florida that US ARC is filing a lawsuit to fight. Then you know that US ARC is a very important part of our reptile keeping hobby. We wouldn't be doing very well without them. So allow Phil to tell you exactly what it is US ARC does. You can learn a little bit and uh, <laughs> you're watching Triple B TV. Uh, so U.S. ARC's role, so we do a lot of things. Uh, we're kind of legislative watchdogs. We keep an eye out for anything coming up that's going to affect pretty much anybody across the trade. And just to get out of the way now, we're certainly not a big snake advocacy. Um, we do a lot more than that, but that's kind of what we're known for because of our federal lawsuit. But certainly uh, got our fingers in a whole lot of other pies. Uh, we're a professional voice in advocacy. Obviously, as you know, there are certain people in the trade who don't make the best rep representatives for our trade. Uh, so I'm the guy who uh, doesn't have as many holes in my body as some other people who kind of puts on a little better face and can put on a suit and show up. So, And uh, we have a lot of things that a lot of people may not even be aware of. So we have a keepers and breeders ethics. Um, speaking of giant reptiles yesterday, we actually have sample acquisition forms that people can use that just kind of says that the buyer is aware of how, how large the animal is going to get, how long the animal is going to live things along those lines. So we actually have templates for that in Word. You can download them from usarc.org and put your company logo on it or whatever you want to do. Uh, we have sample BMPs on certain sectors of the trade, uh, best management practices. And uh, sometimes we sue people. <laughs> we don't like to do that. It costs a lot of money. It's not fun. The federal lawsuit took us three and a half years. Uh, so it certainly doesn't get things accomplished quickly. That's a last resort, but sometimes it happens. A lot of people aren't aware, especially if you're talking to dog and cat people, which dogs and cats are awesome. We all love dogs and cats too. But four to five percent of U.S. households have reptiles. That's reptiles specifically. Add on to that another one percent or so for amphibians. And you're talking, I mean, one in every 20 households. It's, it's a lot of people, about five million U.S. households. And the popularity is increasing because not everybody can have a dog or cat, especially now. Um, a lot of people don't have yards if you're living in multifamily dwellings. It's hard to get your dog or cat, well hopefully you're not walking your cat, you're going to get some looks, but hard to get your dog out and walk him. And also a lot more time commitment involved with dogs and cats than versus some reptiles and amphibians. And regulators are really unaware of just how common these animals are as pets now. So anyway, so you made an investment, you got some animals, dialed in your husbandry and you produce babies, so now all you got to do is sell them, right? And that'd be great if that was that simple, but... Sometimes you got to look at things like this, what species you have, if there are any local, state, national, international laws that apply to selling those species, moving them across state lines, depending on the city you live in um, or the community you live in. There may be business license required, zoning permits, lease agreements. So check out all that stuff. One of the biggest things that drives me nuts is when we have somebody who's invested, has one or 200 reptiles, and they're living in an apartment complex or something that doesn't even allow pets. And then they want me to come in and do something. Well, no, I can't do that. You should have read your lease before you signed it. So again, these are just important things to look over, especially before you go investing a lot of money. So who doesn't like us? I'm just going to go over this quickly. Hopefully a lot of people in the room are aware of this, but animal rights groups, which animal rights groups are people who don't even believe we should have dogs, cats, horses. We shouldn't be getting eggs from chickens. We shouldn't be getting milks from cows. These are animal rights people. Uh, they're trying to remove all animals from our lives and it's important to know the difference between the animal rights groups and legitimate animal welfare groups because a lot of the groups, Humane Society of the United States, even the ASPCA, they label themselves as animal welfare groups, which is what everybody in this room is an animal welfare advocate, but actually they're way more extreme and they're actually animal rights people. And the enviros, which is kind of a complex subject, but a lot of environmental groups, so they're out there promoting you know, don't kill wells, you know, alternative energy sources. But there are other groups who don't really do a lot of work at all. All they're doing is fundraising, saying that they're doing work. 
uh, but you need to really research any money that you're and nonprofit that you're giving your money to. And really at this point, especially with the animal rights groups, they're making money. I mean, Humane Society of the United States brings in almost $200 million a year um, by showing commercials about dogs and cats. They don't run one single animal shelter. Uh, every local and state humane society is totally separate from the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, less than 1% of the money that anyone sends to HSUS actually goes to a, a local shelter. And basically they're con artists. Uh, who else doesn't like us? Mi miseducated lawmakers and government officials. The good thing about that is, as opposed to animal rights people who you're never going to convince otherwise, uh, you can actually educate if you do it properly, um, lawmakers and government officials. So, so that's good. Unless you get a government official or decision maker who is an animal rights activist, then you got a whole other problem. And I'm going to get into some of the issues that we face. So national and international issues first. And I'm just going to call it silliness. I'm not saying CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. That's not silly. Uh, but some of the things we're seeing with CITES now is that we have animal rights and enviro groups who have infiltrated CITES to the point um, that they're fundraising off of filing petitions to get species listed. So they may not actually do any work to help save those species or protect those species. But again, they're filing these petitions. A lot of times there's bogus science that's used. But again, CITES has been infiltrated by these groups and it's, and it's a real problem. And again, it's just groups looking to get attention and fundraise rather than to actually help animals. I mean, it's, it's an industry in itself. It's an, it's, animal rights is an industry and they've learned how to make money off of lying. Got it on video. I'll have a lawsuit <laughs> uh, next week. Anyway, uh, wrong messaging. So when a new species is listed under CITES, this is what happens. I mean, they applause and they're happy because another species is in need of protection. And the same with ESA. Uh, so the Endangered Species Act, um, which we could get in, you can read a lot more about this on the US ARC website, but you know, ESA is a huge conflict. It's duplicative of CITES. It actually hinders conservation efforts, but the same thing. A species exists under ESA and we're high-fiving and celebrating because there's another endangered species and it's just, it's really perplexing. Why are we celebrating the fact that there is another species on the brink of extinction? Um, and instead, there should be efforts to stop a list a species from ever being listed. We need to identify it before it gets to the stage of being listed under CITES and ESA. So again, we shouldn't be celebrating when species are listed under CITES or ESA. It's bad news. We need to start working on programs to protect the animals before we get to that point. A little bit of reality, um, again, what I just went over. So ESA and CITES listings are not reasons to celebrate. Um, hopefully the animals will get some protection at that point, but it should have really happened before that. Um, and I mean, the real threat, um, certainly the pet trade has played its role, unfortunately, but as if you saw Philippe's talk last night and what Madagascar looks like today, I mean, it's just unreal how fast natural habitat is just being removed from our planet. And someday sooner than we think, you know, it's just going to be humans and whatever pets that we're allowed to keep, but animal rights groups are even trying to stop that from happening. And again, we should not be celebrating when these listings happen. It means that we, didn't, we weren't successful in stopping that from happening. A little more reality. Species are continually added to ESA and CITES. So at some point, I mean, your, whatever species you're working with today may not be listed, but it may be five years from now, 10 years from now, but, it, but it's going to happen because habitat is being lost and they're just going to keep adding species. So there is a SAVES Act, which was introduced last Congress and was not successful. I believe it was H.R. 2603. It was reintroduced this year as H.R. 30, and I'm not going to get into all of it. Again, all this is available at usarc.org. But there are so many reasons that the SAVES Act should happen. So what the SAVES Act would do, it would say that any species listed under the Endangered Species Act that we are keeping and breeding currently in the United States would not be hindered by the captive bred wildlife permits and other problems you have with selling those animals across state lines. So if the SAVES Act passed, you could sell radiated tortoises across state lines. Rather than now, both the buyer and the seller have to have a $200 CVW permit and United States Fish and Wildlife Service has not even issued 
CBW permits to private keepers for almost four years now, I believe, so it's pretty ridiculous. You can't even get the permits. A lot of confusion actually just in the last year or two about the Lacey Act. So there are two parts of the Lacey Act. Basically, you should really consider them two separate laws. So we have Title 16 and Title 18. Where the confusion has come in recently, uh, specifically with Brazilian and Australian species, is the fact that Title 16 of the Lacey Act actually gives the United States Fish and Wildlife Service authority to regulate foreign policy, which basically gives them authority to say, this animal may have been smuggled out of Brazil. Brazil has tell, told us that we have never exported that species, and now you're gonna move that species across state lines in the United States, and we're gonna cite you for it. So it's a little bit of a, of a mess. As compared to Title 18, so the confusion came in, people thought US ARC won the lawsuit, we can ship these animals across state lines, but Title 18, again, is basically a separate law dealing only with injurious species. That's where a lawsuit applied. So since US ARC won our lawsuit, now you can ship the nine species of big snakes that are listed as well as the 201 species of caudates across state lines, but that has nothing to do with the Title 16 FWS enforcement of foreign policy. And in case you missed it, a couple years ago, uh, the National Federal Appellate Court said that we agree with ARC. That was actually in the court decision, that quote, and it's kind of a big deal. Again, it took us three and a half years, but we did win that lawsuit. Originally filed because of big snakes, but now you can also ship 201 species of salamanders and caudates across state lines because of that. Some of you saw me out in the lobby working. This is what I was working on the last two days. So we just got the language for this on Friday. Um, an acronym should make something easier to say. It really doesn't apply in this case. Um, but this is the acronym they're using for this bill. It's the Traveling Exotic Animal and Public Safety Protection Act. So again, we just got the language on Friday. The press release was over two weeks ago, and we had to wait around for the language. Um, H.R. 2863 is the bill number, so this is a federal bill, and it bans traveling animal performances. And all of us think, yeah, that probably is not going to affect me. I don't really care. Animal rights groups sell it as the end of burning elephants with cigars and things like that is how they spin it. The way it's written, it trickles down to every person in this room. If you take whatever species you work with into a school, that's going to be illegal. If you put an animal into a car or van or any type of vehicle, transport it away from your facility to give an educational talk on it, it's going to be banned if this law passes. Whether or not it's actually enforced down to that level, I would say it's unlikely, but as it is worded, an enforcement officer could actually cite you for that and you would be a federal criminal, which is just unreal. Who writes these bills? Members of Congress don't write this stuff. It is rare for a lawmaker at the, at the local state, especially federal level and state level. They're not writing this stuff. This, these are written, so these animal rights bills are written by an animal rights group. They fish around through Congress to find somebody who will sign on as a sponsor and author for this. But just because you're called an author doesn't mean you wrote the thing. So the whole thing, if you read it, I mean, you can tell that there is no way that a member of Congress would even write this. And again, even that in itself is highly disappointing for a member of Congress to sign in that we're paying a lot of money to, to just sign on to this stuff because they're believing the propaganda that these animal rights people sold them. It's just extremely disappointing. I mean, <laughs> again, if you read this bill and saw the blatant lies, I mean, that member of Congress who signed on and sponsored this bill should just be removed immediately because it's, it's complete nonsense. And I got the action alert posted yesterday sometime, uh, so you can check it out at usarc.org. So it's at the front of our homepage right now. Um, at this point, it hasn't been read. It hasn't been introduced to a committee yet. So most bills don't pass. Um, this is not the first time we've seen this bill, uh, but it is something to be aware of. And going back to that quickly, again, it's not written to apply to this, but there's also a concern that even taking animals to reptile shows so that basically there's an audience of people who are coming to see those animals, it could even trickle down to affect reptile shows. So again, it's something we need to be concerned with. So moving on to state levels. So something US ARC does every morning is we get email alerts. So I have search words, uh, injurious species, invasive species, for example. So any state or federal bill that comes up with one of those words, um, every morning I check my email and go through the alerts, uh, get my cup of coffee, and I do that. Um, so depending on uh, the time of year, so legislative season basically runs about the same as tax season, the height of it, so you're looking, you know, mid-January through April or May. Depending on the day, you know, 
I may spend five or six hours a day just going through and making sure that these bills don't apply to us or don't affect us. And then if it doesn't affect us, but may affect some mammal people or other exotic animal owners, you know, I'll contact them and send them to that. Uh, so dangerous wild animal laws, that's another one you think, you know, it's not gonna apply to me, I'm keeping geckos. So the West Virginia example, so that law passed, I think it was 2014. At one point it included over 10,000 species of animals. Um, basically anything that was non-native to West Virginia was considered a dangerous wild animal, which was just unreal. Um, we got all reptiles removed from that except for Komodo dragons. So if you're a Komodo dragon keeper and you're upset, you can send me an email. Uh, but that's the only reptile or amphibian that remained listed on West Virginia's dangerous wild animal law. Uh, traveling animal acts, so I mentioned this earlier, uh, California. So it didn't affect us, it only included crocodilians, which are really hard to, to keep in California through permits anyway. Um, but it was US Ark who got the alert and posted it, and then I reached out to the affected stakeholders who were mammal and other people who do educational programs with animals and alerted them to that traveling animal act. ESA and CITES, CITES misunderstandings. A lot of states don't understand what ESA and CITES are and they put bad laws in place. So actually the last time I checked, there are 26 states where it's even illegal to own a species that is listed under, under the Endangered Species Act. So not just illegal to breed it or sell it, it's actually illegal to keep it. So I don't actually know of that law being enforced anywhere, but again, it's, it's on the books and it, it's kind of scary. Um, Arizona, we stopped it four years ago. It just came up again this year, and thanks to James Badman, um, I worked with him, and he worked with some other affected stakeholders in Arizona, so we stopped it again this year. But again, this is something that we're seeing today. New Mexico, uh, Senate Bill 38 was this year too. It would have banned breeding and selling of any CITES-1 listed species. Uh, we actually stopped that. And I won't name the, this was another one, the legislators don't write these things. It was a, a nonprofit a charity and environmental group who wrote it and I talked to the person who wrote the bill on the phone and I am not going to stand up here and say that I am a CITES expert but it was unreal the things I had to correct the person who wrote the bill on about CITES. It was just he was as in inaccurate as he could be and thought he understood CITES and, and didn't understand a darn thing and didn't understand the implications of the bill if it passed but it didn't. At the local level, so as opposed to state, which really has a, you only have a handful of states that have a full year session, most of them are over by about May, local ordinances can pop up at any time. So you always gotta be watching for those. Really the best way to monitor them is if your city has a website, you can check the agendas every time that your city council or whatever has a, has a meeting, uh, watch the newspaper. I usually find out about them because an article gets posted in a newspaper and I'll get an alert via email. Uh, since I believe he's in the room, or at least he was earlier, so uh, Stall Exotic Animal Veterinary Services stepped in, and that was hugely beneficial in Arlington, which Arlington is a major metropolitan city right across the river from D.C. What happens in Arlington, the whole country watches things that happen in Arlington. It's just, it's a major city. And it was a really overreaching exotic animal ban. It was even going to ban uh, ferrets and hedgehogs. I believe at one point it was snakes over four feet that it was going to ban. And obviously when you have a veterinarian services, I believe it was Dr. Constanzo who did a lot of the work, um, and obviously Dr. Stahl as well. But, you know, I can come in and talk to these people, and usually that works well. But when I have, when I'm being backed by veterinarians, obviously that lends a huge, huge benefit to what I'm telling them. And this was something that was pushed by the Humane Society of the United States. And in front of my face, it's just unreal. I mean, they were in there, they've done the same thing in Florida. They tell the legislators that U.S. ARC is a, how do they word it? Well, they say that I'm a, I'm a high-powered, well-paid lobbyist, which, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they talk about how influential U.S. ARC is. And, you know, in a good year, you know, we'd be thrilled if we bring in half a million dollars and they're bringing in $200 million, have multiple lobbyists in every state, and they're, they're they're making us look like the bad guys who are making law anyway. It's just absurd. The, the lies they tell in public, which tells you, imagine what they're telling these people when there's no one else in the room. Uh, just like last week in Arkansas, there actually wasn't an alert about this, but some stakeholders I had worked with because I was working on some state Arkansas stuff. Um, it's a city of 40,000 people, I believe, so definitely not a tiny little place, but they wanted to ban, the options were going to be a ban on all reptiles or they were going to make a, 
they were going to apply their dog and cat. The city currently has a four pet limit, which only applies to dog and cat, but they wanted to apply reptiles to that. So you would have only been able to have four pets total. So two ball pythons, a leopard gecko, and a dog would have been all you could have. Um, I didn't post an alert. I didn't want to bring a whole lot of attention to it. And since I knew the stakeholders and knew that they would be able to represent the community well, I just sent them a lot of information, had phone calls with them, and they totally nipped it in the bud. But if they hadn't been notified of it, the thing would have passed, and then we would have had to gone back and try and amend it. But luckily, we were able to stop it. And again, that was just last week. It started, they got aware of it on a Friday, and the hearing was on a Tuesday. Uh, these pet limits are pretty much nonsense. Um, they claim that they're going to stop animal hoarding, which anybody in the room knows that if someone is committing true animal hoarding, which is just hundreds of animals that aren't being cared for, um, live animals on top of dead animals, I mean, that is a mental illness. And any kind of law that you put in place is not going to stop that. Uh, why we should all be concerned, uh, collective punishment is a huge issue. Uh, so what you have is, you know, unfortunately we'll have an irresponsible person who lets a snake get loose in a city. That is enough. One incident is enough to trigger some type of ordinance. So however you want to word it, you can't let one bad apple ruin the bushel or whatever you want to say. But again, a lot of times the responsible people are just thrown in the loop because of one irresponsible person. And unfortunately, that's how our government works today. It's really bad government policy, but we see it far too often. And animal rights lies. Again, I've told you some of the things they say in public. Um, the things they tell these legislators behind closed doors is just unreal. And we do have a PR nightmare. I mean, snakes specifically, most studies will show that 60% of the general public says that they have a fear of snakes. That's hard to overcome. And obviously, when you're dealing with groups who bring in 500 times more money than you, they have a lot better public relations than we do. Why things need to change, so this is going back to kind of ESA and CITES issues, is we rarely see collaboration. Unfortunately, the groups that push to have these animals listed under CITES and ESA, they don't want us keeping the animals, uh, so we don't have any collaboration. It's hard to get government groups to work with us. I mean, we've heard examples at Herpeton about how people were willing to donate 100 or 1,000 you know, captive bred animals to help repopulate, and there's just so much red tape that it's hard to even get collaboration with, with whatever government, whether it's state or national, whatever it is, but it's, we just don't see enough collaboration. And again, to mention Emmanuel's talk and the, how Madagascar looks today, the wild really no longer exists, especially here in the US. Um, I haven't traveled <laughs> at all really abroad, so but I'm sure the same is true pretty much across the globe. And you know, we're the real issue. I mean, the human population is growing at such a tremendous rate that you know, the, the earth just can't handle it. And we're chopping down trees so we can grow food and, or make uh, money off of something, whereas the, the trees weren't providing any profit. So there's just, there's too many people. So human impact. So even wild animals, unless it's an island, um, you know, that can be bought for $2 million, Gary Bagnall, Uh, if you know if there's a larger land mass, even wild animals, even if we can preserve a thousand acres or ten thousand acres, it's still going to be surrounded by road. Anytime those animals go to cross the road, there's a likelihood that they're going to be hit. So even if we preserve the wild, say in you know the continental United States, it's still going to be fragmented, and those animals are not going to be protected unless you can figure out how to teach them not to cross roads. So without us and what we do with the keeping and breeding of reptiles. Uh, there's really no more appreciation for animals. So if people have met a turtle or been to an educational talk about a snake and got an appreciation for snake, you know, they're not going to run over those animals. Um, the reason I'm talking about running over animals, so this is an Indiana Eastern box turtle, protected, endangered. You can run over them, but I can't take one home with me if I see it. So there was a Clemson study that was done in 2012 that actually showed an alarming rate of people actually swerve to hit turtles and snakes on the road. So the student actually placed fake animals on the road and then studied how many people would intentionally swerve to hit those animals. And there's lots of articles about it. Down at the bottom is the titles of one of the articles. But, but again, it's just unreal. And this next quote, I mean, it, it's scary. So the student who did this study asked a group of 110 college students whether they had intentionally run over a turtle or been in a car where someone intentionally swerved to hit a turtle. 110 students, 34 students raised their hands out of 110 people, a third of the class. 
that, that is scary. Obviously, no one in this room would do such a thing. We're the people who are pulling over to move the animals across the road. Uh, but this was just a random raise your hand study. And you know, it's alarming that that many people even raise their hand where there are 10 or more others who were afraid to raise their hand because they realized that running over turtles, you know, shouldn't happen. And more roads, so just, uh, they extended I-69 in the southwest portion of Indiana. I drive about 60 or 70 miles of that when I go between where I live and my parents' house. On one spring day, over just about a three mile stretch, two years after this extension of I-69 went into place, I counted 36 eastern box turtles, an endangered species in Indiana, every single one of them did. So again, how much, how many turtles the construction itself killed, and now we have this road going through it, the speed limit is 70. Uh, my odometer's broken my car, about 85 equals 70 in my car, anyway. Um, but again, you can imagine people going this quickly, you know, they're not probably hitting them on purpose, but again, just over a three mile stretch to have three dozen dead turtles. Um, I had to drive it actually on my way to the airport for this. I didn't see a single, I guess the box turtles just happened to be moving. This certainly isn't any type of, you know, scientific data, but in that road area where I saw the three dozen dead turtles, I didn't see a single one. About 10 or 15 miles up the road, I saw two within about a quarter mile stretch that were still alive and getting ready to, to try and cross the road. Obviously I got out and helped those, but doing that on this road obviously isn't much fun. And another thing, it's not even a well-traveled road yet. There are not, there's not much traffic on this road and just to see that many turtles is upsetting. And again, they're endangered. I can't breed them in my backyard, but we can run over them on the road. So this is another pretty scary sight. So if you've ever been herping in the Everglades, you know what you do, you go hit uh, the gate at about 10 o'clock whenever it gets dark and you drive at about 10 or 15 miles an hour all the way down to Flamingo. The speed limit's actually 55, but if you're road herping, you don't go that fast. So this was two years ago, I believe, I went road cruising on it. This is an American crocodile, that's not an alligator, who was crossing the road. Um, you can imagine seeing that at 55 miles an hour, somebody's gonna get hurt or you're both gonna get hurt. And there is just so much roadkill on this road. Again, so this is a, a federally protected nature preserve with a road going through it that has an immense amount of wildlife going across it and the speed limit is 55 miles an hour. And I've never once seen any type of police on this road, so people are driving even faster than that. They're hauling boats. Um, again, the amount of dead animals on it is absurd. There are so many dead animals that the birds of prey at night, so this is a night hawk, um, they swoop down in the road and they even get hit by cars. So this was a night hawk that went to swoop down to collect uh, whatever a dead turtle or dead snake that was in the road and it actually got hit by a car. Uh, just something we do, so this is a, just a Facebook post on our page, but it's pretty cool. It's got, this was actually a screenshot from over a year ago, I think almost 400,000 shares. So what you can't see is we actually put down a whole bunch of things that you do when you do see a turtle crossing the road, you know, like if you can, you just move it across the road in the direction it was headed. It's got some safe handling practices, but again, that's pretty cool that we're getting some education like that out there. Again, without us, this is a little dude at a reptile show watching a David Attenborough video with his toy snake and his turtle backpack. So again, this is a little dude that's probably gonna grow up to be a biologist or a conservationist that would not probably have gone that route if it weren't for reptile shows and the breeding and keeping of reptiles. This, I, ha I had to throw this in. I, I, I somehow find a way to work it in in just about every talk I give, but the absurd, this is Animal Planet. Animal Planet. Eight, first, I mean, we have eight, 18 foot long boa constrictors, which has never happened in the history of boa constrictors. And if I have to tell you that's not a boa constrictor, you're probably in the wrong room. <laughs> and then I, I added this too. So talking about snake length, we all have stories like this. Uh, so I once bought a boa that was 10 feet long and 60 pounds. When it arrived, it was a six foot long boa and 10 pounds, including the shipping container. So Jeff Ronnie told me that when I was working on another project, but again, especially in the media, they'll talk about 10 foot snakes that they saw in a park that ended up being like a four foot long rat snake. Um, so a lot of times snake lengths get originated and it's not, or exaggerated and it's not good for us. Uh, one thing we gotta understand, you certainly can't talk down to them, but if you ever go in to present before a city council or state legislature, you have to understand they know absolutely nothing about reptiles and amphibians, zero. It can't be the same as when you're giving a talk here. They know nothing about snakes. They think snakes are slimy. They think all pythons get 49 feet long. 
Um, they, they know nothing. So again, you can't talk down to them, but you kind of got to talk to them like they're kindergartners and educate them. And a lot of times they'll listen as long as you present yourself properly. And it, it can really make a difference. Uh, this is an example from the Georgia Reptile Society, a great slide just because they did a reptile outreach program. That is the mayor of the city with a boa constrictor around his neck. So obviously something like that, you're not going to have to worry about some crazy overreaching reptile ordinance happening in that city while that guy is mayor because he learned about reptiles. Uh, scout troops, another educational talk. Uh, another pick from the Georgia Reptile Society, the sheriff. You know, a lot of times they're involved in writing ordinances. <laughs> when you can get the sheriff of the town to put a boa constrictor around his neck, there's probably not going to be a ban on boa constrictors. And it was a very busy, I've actually haven't seen a legislative season nearly as busy as in the last six and a half years as this year was. Um, luckily, we, we stopped all the bills, um, but that's just one of the things we're working on. That's every year. We're working on the four inch turtle rule, uh, Lacey Act, Title 16 issues. We're working on a U.S. Arc Florida chapter because Florida is constantly getting hit by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission on overreaching measures. And the Endangered Species Act, we're still working on some of those issues. And I'm almost done. I like to end with some cool pictures of animals and people. So just a kid learning about tortoises in a classroom. Uh, Southern California Herp Association. This woman had never interacted with reptiles. She popped into the show and stood there for about 20 minutes with that tegu's head in her hands asking questions about tegus and said it was the coolest thing she had ever seen. Um, Chicago Herp Society, this is a reptile fest, another cool event. Uh, this is a reptile show, a little girl with a ball python, a little girl with an albino boa constrictor. And native herps, you know, it's always important to talk about native herps at any programs you do. This one, just because I love this picture. So this was a professor I worked with in Maine when we were working on a Maine issue. Uh, he works at the University of Maine and does research with herps. And just a cool photo. And Kira, who has a little YouTube channel, is really cool to watch. And uh, that's the end. Thank you, Phil. We appreciate all the hard work you put in, man. Um, Next week, we've got Emmanuel Van Hagen giving a talk on the Madagascar day geckos and how their environment is disappearing. He's got lots of great pictures and slides along with his presentation, so hope to see you guys there next week. Until then, you've been watching Triple B TV. Y'all take care.